How many people woke up this morning and said, I sound like Barry White after last night? So we're going to talk about a lot of things today. And for all the people that were here last year, raise your hand. I just want to know who you are. Ooh, spicy. Not that many. So this is, is the spiritual, if last year's talk was Blade Runner the original, this one is Blade Runner 2049. So it's good, same theme, but different angle. And what I really want to do this year is make it something practical. So How to Make a Living with Touch Designer is a classic Elber's title, very boring, very straightforward. But I also have alternate titles for this talk, Business, Wisdom, and Gifts. I thought that one was a good one. Bob Ross and your income. I've been watching a lot of Bob Ross lately, so uh, I don't know if you guys have not been watching Bob Ross. It's on Netflix. Six figures of freedom? Question mark. So this is our master plan today. I'm going to take you through the four main things that I think will help everybody have a more successful business life, personal life career, work, and really it comes down to four key things that I always tell everybody. And if you're a reader of my blog or newsletter, you've probably seen me talking about narrative lately a lot in the story. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about being hungry. Hungry. We're going to talk about knowing yourself, knowing where you are in your career. And then finally we're going to talk about building your own algorithm. Because we often oversimplify the algorithm that we're presenting to people. So, if we get started with what I think is the main question here, is, but why? why? Why are we all here in this room? Why are we talking about business at a cool touch designer conference where we could be checking out cool generative graphics, we could be playing with vibes, name any other hardware that means nothing to me anymore, any of those things. Why are we here? Because the unfortunate reality is that if you aren't making enough money to pay the bills, you can't do the fun work that you really want to do. And the second unfortunate reality is that nobody really thinks it's important to share their experiences and learnings over all the years that you maybe have been doing business, maybe you've had your career and it's been going well, and they're not really sexy topics to share. I mean, this is not going to be as exciting as, you know, maybe the GLSL thing, because you're all, you're all way too obsessed with GLSL, by the way. you got to tone down the GLSL and take up the day reads. And finally, the why. We don't want our dreams to just be dreams. How many people have I talked to who said, I would really love to do X, Y, Z, or travel to some place, do installations full time, and they said, you know what, but I have to keep my day job. I have to do this other, I have to do web development during the day so I can afford to do my passion projects on the side. And there's no reason both those things can't be somewhere in the middle. Now, why is this so hard? I mean, we talked about why it's something we're talking about. Why is this so hard? And I wanted to ask this question because as we're going through the talk, you will probably think to yourself, God, that's so obvious. But why are we talking about this? But it's hard because we often are blinded by exciting things and forget to do the really easy things right in front of us that are going to help our careers, help our workflows, and just help keep us in business. The narrative. And this one's a funny one because everyone's like, oh, I'm a storyteller. And then you ask them what they do and they just start rambling for like 30 minutes in like the worst story I've ever heard. So the narrative is, is I think, the first step in every career. If you don't have a clear narrative about who you are, what you're doing, why you're doing it, you're just a walking tech spec recycler. And the unfortunate reality that we live in now is that tech specs aren't cool anymore. You know, tech specs used to be the selling points that we used to use five, eight years ago. We'd be like, oh yeah, we did the the thing with the 40 connects and 10 projectors and 10 million jillion lumens, that was us. And people would be like, oh cool, well, let's, we'll hire you. That doesn't fly anymore because everyone's done GLSL, everyone's done projection mapping. 
everyone's done 10 bajillion Lumen projects. So those things aren't impressive anymore. So we have to compel people in a different way. And this is my Arnold impression. Who is your daddy and what does he do? Because that's the question that you really need to ask yourself in the morning when you wake up. That's the question. When somebody says, what do you do? They don't want to know how you've done it. They don't want to know what gear you used on it. They want to know who are you and what are you doing? And there's three reasons I think narrative is probably the most important thing in your business. The first is that it reduces the chance of broken telephone. Remember that game you used to play where you would sit in a circle and then one person would whisper to the other person, you know, the ring, 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 banana phone, and then the next person would be like, ring, 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 peanut butter phone, and then like, rah, 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 rah. like it was the funniest thing. But this happens in real life all the time. And if your narrative is complicated, if the story you're trying to tell people about yourself, your company, your work is complicated, chances are they're going to share that incorrectly to somebody else. Chances are, if I came to you and said, I'm Albers, I work with Touch Designer, I'm really good with stops, uh, chops, shuffling is like my favorite thing in the world, uh, I do a lot of GLSL, I know how to use window comp really well, you're going to leave that, forget half of it, and then when somebody asks you what is Elber do, you're gonna be like, I don't know, he's like, I guess he does touch designer. I think he does touch designer. I don't know what else he was saying, but he does touch designer. And this is important because one of the main things that I've realized in my career is that the person you're talking to is almost never the final decision maker or the sole decision maker in the process of getting you hired. You might be talking to a producer, you might be talking to a project manager, you might be talking to a fellow developer, but they have to take everything, everything that you've told them, all the reasons that you've got them excited to work with you. They gotta go back to work, and then they gotta sit down with four or five other people and convince them that this is the right idea. Convince them that, oh, you know what, we do wanna hire elders because X, Y, Z. And if we don't help them tell a really simple and effective version of our story, the unfortunate reality is they're gonna mess it up. It's like, if, if I tried to recite to you a really complicated story like Dostoevsky, you know, the possessed, I try to run it off to you in 30 seconds, and I say, okay, now you tell it back to me. It's not going to be the same, but Hansel and Gretel, easy story. I mean, how many people can tell me how Hansel and Gretel goes off the top of your head? We need to make our narratives, our biographies, our one-line introductions, the way we introduce ourselves to people, should be like Hansel and Gretel, should be like the, uh, what's the eggshell guy who fell off? Humpty Dumpty. I don't know the name, but I know the story. How effective is that narrative? And the reason we want to do this is we want to create advocates for our company. Because like I'm saying, you're almost never dealing with the final decision maker. Every time you're talking to somebody, they have to go back to their company, they have to tell their project manager, yeah, we'll hire Elvers, he's good because X, Y, Z. You're almost never taking the person in front of you and telling them to hire you and then signing on a dotted line like, okay, cool, let's go. That never happens. Even if you're talking with you know, the executives, the CEOs, they'll be like, okay, cool, well, you know what, now you have to go talk to this person or, oh, I'll tell our project lead and they'll contact you. And guess what he has to do? He has to go advocate for you to everybody else why this is a good idea. And the third thing, which I said ironically is, is what we always forget, is to be compelling. We spend all of our time trying to make these wonderful artistic pieces, these interactive experiences, these majestic rooms we go into with infinity mirrors and you look down and it's like space time explodes and you're like, sick. And then when somebody asks you, what do you do? You're like, oh yeah, well I do a lot of touch time stuff. I don't know, I do a lot of stuff. How many times you heard, how many, every time, I want to see a raise of hands how many people have done something similar. Where somebody asks you what you do and you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Like it was like a cute thing, like a four-year-old kid did, and you're like, I don't know what I do. Well, guess what? <laughs> that doesn't fly in business. You can't tell a company, I don't know what I do, or I do a lot of stuff. Guess who's not getting hired? The guy who does a lot of stuff. So you have to be compelling. The story that we're going to tell not only has to Tell them who you are, tell them what you do, why you're excited, it has to be specific, compelling, relatable, 
in the same way we approach the artwork that we do, we have to approach our story and our sales pitches in the exact same way. Now that's all well and good, but I wanted this to be a practical talk. So I got all, and then, and then it's happening over here. It's happening. So, you might say, how do I actually go about doing this? How do I take my dreams and don't let them just be dreams? Step one, pick five important and specific words about what you want to do. Not what you do. What you do is cool, but you always have to look forward to what you want to do. Because it's all too common for people to say, well, I'm working a lot in events and live stuff, but I really want to get into architecture, and then they make a biography that's completely about events and their experience in events. And guess who's not getting hired by architects? The person who only advertises themselves for events. So, specific, important, and only five words. And this is tough because every time I do this, everybody comes back to me with 10 or 20 words, and they're super generic. You can't use the word interactive, I'm sorry, that's banned. Experiential, don't use that one, that one sucks. Experiences, that one's boring. Give me some, give me some words, I wanna hear some words. Give me your words off the top of your head. Immersion. Immersive, that one's, that's junk. Installation. Intersection, junk. Installation. Installation, junk, everything's an installation. Me standing here is an installation. You can't sell that. All these words, even though we feel so comfortable with them, we advertise ourselves as interactive developers, experience makers, these words are so generic, these can be anything. If I went outside and just put the microphone on a podium, wow, I'm, a, I'm an experience maker. But I could also go and projection map a giant building and be an experience maker. How are we supposed to differentiate what these words mean if we're using the most generic words possible? So I always say, be as specific as possible. Do you like robotics? Make that your selling point. Make this, tell people that I love robotics. Do you love physical spaces with digital layers like uh, our good friend David was telling us about yesterday? That's a great specific way of explaining the things he likes to do. Do you like bringing concepts to, to, to youth? Tell people about the specific things you want to do. Don't just be generic and say, oh, I do interactive stuff or experiences, well, magic of the imagination. This is all, this is all jabroni talk. This doesn't do anything for you. So of those five words, I usually break it down into one word about who you are and the rest about what you do. And the who is important because the business lexicon of vocabulary is rich. And unfortunately, a studio is not the same thing as a collective, which is not the same thing as a company, which is not the same thing as an agency, which is not the same thing as a solo practice. All of these things are different things. And you know, that's different from a team. The way you present who you are, who your company is, who you and your team are, should also be specific. You know, tell people, are you, are you, do you guys want to be seen as artists? Do you guys want to be seen as like the real, you know, Albert Sorkabi suited types? The businessy people? Do you want to be seen as an agency who helps connect different people together? Be specific about who you are. Are you solo? Are you an international artist? Are you a collective? of space travelers, you know, whatever it is, be specific about who you are. And then step two, make 20 variations of your story with those five words. Now you don't have to put all five words in every single variation. You know, the first variation could have the first two words, one variation could be all five words, one variation could be the who, and then you know, two or three what's. But make 20 variations, because this is what I see happens all the time. You sit down, you open Google Docs, you write one line, you're like, oh, it's kind of good. You close it, you come back three days later, you change the edit a little bit, and you're like, guess what? I'm in business. And you would never approach your art the same way. How many times have you sat down on the creative process to make an installation? And you spent days, you spent weeks, you, you had brainstorming sessions, you wrote every single idea down, you iterated, you talked to friends about it, you said, well, how is this one, do I think this one, what if we went deeper on this one? Treat this work the same way you treat your art. Make 20 variations, 20 completely different sentences, not just one that you've edited and think is the best thing since sliced bread. Because then step three is important. You don't have 20 variations. Call your friends. Call people you've never met before. Go on the Discord, go on the Facebook, go on the forum. 
Say, hey, I'm trying to describe my life story. And here's some of the words I've chosen for it. What do you guys think? You know, our community is very unique. We love sharing, we love talking to each other, but I don't see anybody sharing business advice or business wisdom or any kind of collaborative work developing each other's practices. So don't be afraid. Share them, get feedback, and then pick the best one and memorize it. Memorize. This is the most important. Don't mess up. Once you have the line, don't. It's not jazz. Don't remake it every time you tell it. Just say the same thing, word by word. If you have crafted 20 variations of your story with five very specific important words, and you've got feedback on them, and you pick the best one, chances are it's pretty good. Chances are it's pretty solid. You don't need to like riff on it every time. Just say it. When somebody asks what do you do, you be like, oh yeah, I do. And then take the conversation from him. Now that's your one-liner. Every time somebody asks you what you do, you come up with that. Every time you, know, you start an introduction, or you email, you're, you're looking for clients, you start with that. This is your one-liner. And then the only things you need to do to kind of take that and extend it a little bit, if you need a biography, a little bit of a longer one, is add a few strong sentences. And I mean strong. Important, like every word should be like, I can't delete this word because if I deleted this word, the whole thing loses meaning. These have to be strong sentences, but previous clients, places you've been in the world, awards you've been, I, you know how many people have won awards and don't put them in their bios? Like, are you guys out of your mind? Like, every time you win an award, change your bio. Award winning, remember, the elder certain you remember. You know, flex, flex all the talent and experience you have into the shortest sentences that are strong and concise, put them next to your one-liner, you have a very powerful, short, and readable biography. Because you know what I never read? The bios that are more than like three or four lines. When, when I go on, you know, I'm not, I don't want to name the websites, but I don't want to throw shade at websites, but I go on the websites where you see installations, and you click on one, and it's like a three-page dissertation on space-time dilution because it's a projector, and I'm like, I'm not reading this, this is next. So you need to keep it short, you need to keep it strong, and then step five, it's happening. But I mean, maybe it's a little premature to get to the it's happening, that'll come soon. But this is, this is simple. This is what I'm saying, why, why are we having this talk and you're gonna think, oh, well I could, I mean, does it really take, you know, a guy with 10 years of experience to tell me to pick five words, put them in a couple sentences, and ask my friends for feedback? Unfortunately, it does, because we don't do this. And a lot of the talk is going to be things like this that are simple, but if you do them, you will stand out in what is quickly becoming uh, a crowded space with many, many, many people. But, like I said, practically, I couldn't leave you without examples of what I mean by strong one-line bios. So this is, this is a technique that I've started calling my free chop, because every time I, I visualize it in my head, I think about like karate chops. And I usually like three karate chops. Sounds nice, you know? You got your one who, you got your one what, and then you got like uh, another what or where. You know, your third chop could be like a side chop or a front chop. But let's take a look, and I love the names. I, so I got some corp, Mr. McChicken, and other corp. These are our example studios today. So we can see here, some corp is a technology studio connecting people to public spaces with hybrid analog digital interfaces. Simple. I bet if I just took this off screen right now, you'd probably remember all the main points, even though you just heard it for three seconds by somebody else saying it. It's specific. You know, we're painting a picture for people of who we are. Some corp is a technology studio. We're not an agency. We're not gonna be some mega corp. We're a small studio focused on technology. And then we have two things that some corp does, and just two. Doesn't mean you can't sell people other things. They're gonna call you, they're gonna say, hey, well, we gotta do this one thing, and we got all this other stuff, whatever, and I'm blah, 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 blah. And then you can say, oh, don't worry, we'll do all of it, we'll take care of all of it. You don't have to, pigeonholing yourself is not a thing. That's not, you, everyone's always afraid, it's like, oh, well, if I be specific, then I won't get it, I wanna do everything. You can still do everything, but you're gonna get called more often if you're specific. So in this case, we have two specific what's. Connecting people to public spaces, very specific because you know we're talking about public spaces, so architects are going to start seeing this. We're talking about connecting, you know, people that digital layers, similar to what David was saying yesterday. 
And then we have a very other specific what? Hybrid analog digital interfaces. You know, start thinking about Arduinos, start thinking about sensors, actuators, maybe web APIs. This, now I'm not saying this is the best bio. I, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't make 20 variations of this one and like tone it down and get feedback. This is a talk, I just put these together. But these are good examples of what your one-liner should be like. When I ask you what you do or, hey, where do you work? Mr. McChicken is an international artist blending robotic and human interactions in emotionally explorative exhibits. Short, specific, easy to remember. Tell, every word in this tells you something important about the company. We have international artists, okay, so it's probably a solo practice, maybe a couple people working with them. Robotic human interactions, very specific. Cool, we like robots, let's, 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 let's play with robots. Emotionally explorative exhibit, exhibits. Very emotionally, that, I didn't realize how difficult emotionally explorative exhibits would be to say very quickly. Maybe not the best in the bio, but you get the idea. This is an artist using robots to make exhibits. Simple, easy to remember, easy for somebody to advocate for you Without the whole, well, I don't know what I do, I guess I've traveled the world for 10 years and I've worked with these 23 people and last project I did we used the biggest pixel shader in the world and it was sweet. Well guess who's not going to gig that person. And the final example, Other Corp is an interactive agency taming wild and unstable technologies into memorable, memorable events and topics. You know, these don't have to be boring. They should be compelling. They should be interesting. People should read them and be like, oh cool, you tame wild and unstable technologies? That sounds sick. Let's work together. Get people excited to work with you. Don't be a tech spec that is narrated out loud. Being hungry. AF. And I won't say what that means for our fellow online viewers. Get hangry. <laughs> Real. And here's the crazy part about being hungry. You need to go Super Saiyan Gopher. Hold on, this is my can I just say this is my favorite gift that's ever been created? <laughs> I can watch that all day. It's a gopher. You guys aren't as impressed. But this is what I always see. Oh, I am hungry. I'm desperate. I'm doing everything I can. Ah! But, the real issue is I'm doing everything but the boring stuff. I'm trying to go out there and speak at conferences, and I'm trying to make cool art and post it on Instagram. Guess what that is? It's usually not how you get gigs. Here's the boring stuff that gets you gigs. And I'm just going to blast through these. You can take a picture. You can watch this later on YouTube. But I'm just going to blast these. Make a list of competitors and email every single one of them saying you're freelance and available for work. How many people do that? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've sat down for like multiple days straight and just email people saying I'm available for work. Like four or five. Do you guys have gigs? Do you guys have gigs? <laughs> They're living the dream. The, the, the round of applause for these people. <laughs> And the crazy part about this one is I always ask people, hey, who are your competitors? And they're like, I get some remark about, I don't have competitors, I'm unique. Oh, great. Good luck, good luck in the business world if you don't have competitors. It means you made up an industry that nobody else is in. So be real. And I'm not talking about like be aggressive competitors and like go find people to like drop kick in the streets. Like don't, don't do that, but know the people in your space. Know the people that are going to be bidding on the same projects as you. Know the people that are probably getting more calls than you. These are your competitors. It's not an aggressive thing. Just know who they are. Number two is same vibe. Make a spreadsheet with email addresses and phone numbers of every company in 100 miles slash kilometers of where you are standing on a daily basis and tell them you want to work on a project with them. Tell them what you have to offer. Send them a little nice personalized email. Say, hey, well, I really like these projects you worked on. I think it would be cool if we could integrate technology into it. Let's talk. I can bring that to the table for you guys. Boring. Absolutely boring. Do you know what is the most boring? Number two. 
Number two sucks, but number two is how you get meetings. Number two is how you start to connect with people in the industry, people outside the industry who want to use the services that we have. This is how you get your name out to people around you. Step number three, email people you know. Tell them you're looking for leads. Tell them you're looking for gigs. For all of the hungry and desperate artists out there, nobody has ever come on Discord and said, hey, Elders, if you have like an extra gig that you're not gonna do, can you just like give it to me? This never happened. And all I have is extra gigs that I don't wanna do. Where do those go? My friends. Only because nobody else asked. If somebody else asked, they'd be like, oh, cool, is an up and comer? For sure, yeah, it's a, it's a small little gig. Take it. So talk to people. Tell them. You know, there's, there's no shame in looking for gigs. I don't know if there's like some stigma around, I don't have a gig, maybe I'm not legitimate. Gigs are up and down. Sometimes you have a lot of gigs, sometimes you don't have any gigs. Number four, invite decision makers in companies that might need your services out of lunch. This should be obvious. Just go, go pay. For, if you pay for somebody's food, they're obligated to listen to you talk for like an hour. Now, I didn't pay for your food, but you're, and you're not really obligated to stay. I mean, you can leave, but please don't leave. Here's a cheat, and the next couple are kind of cheeky. I used to do this thing where I would go on job boards, find all the job offers that I didn't want to do, and email them and tell them I'll just do the same work for cheaper, faster, better, you know, as a freelancer. And they'd be like, who are you? We're looking for like an internal person. I, you know, then you start to open up the conversation. You say, yeah, well, you're looking for somebody internal. I, I understand, but you got to pay them benefits. You got to take care of them. And I'll start to make a case as to why me, as a freelancer, might be better than them trying to hire somebody for. And like I was saying, make friends on the Discord, on the Facebook, on the forum, because people like hiring with friends. Like I said, if I have extra gigs, the first people I call are all my homies. Hey, you busy right now? I got this thing. Not sure if I'm going to do it, but uh, all yours if you want it. Number seven, start talking about your services publicly. I think this is similar to number three. Don't be shy if you have services to offer and maybe you're not at the pinnacle of your career and full-time busy. Just go out there, go on Facebook, go on the Discord, say, hey guys, I'm based in this area and I'm doing a lot of this kind of work and looking for gigs and love to work with everybody. Easy, you gotta get your, yourself in people's minds. And number eight was also another cheeky thing I used to do. I would go on the forum like five times a day, every two or three hours. And I would find, you know the, the uh, job opportunities part? I would literally just refresh that page. And any time a gig came up, quick. DM immediately, say, hey, saw the, saw the post you had, would love to work with you, let's hop on a call, let's talk it out. And then I would go on the forum post and be like, hey, just sent you a, a note, looking forward to chatting, smiley face. Be cheeky, be hungry. Go out there and get those gigs. Do the boring stuff. Don't go on Instagram and try and write a three-page dissertation and then tell people why you're so sophisticated and good at your craft because you did this thing. That stuff doesn't get you gigs. Telling everyone you can tell that you need a gig is probably, if I had to summarize this page as one slide, I would say tell everyone you know you need a gig. Because the harsh reality is everything other than boring stuff is just gambling. Every time you post something on Instagram, it, and I'm not written on Instagram, it's just, it's on my head. But you know, if you post on Facebook, you post on your website or your blog or any of these things, and you just hope that the stars align and client lands on your website and sees it and gives you a call, that's a gamble. You're hoping for chance to be on your side when in fact doing boring things removes chance. Know thyself. Know thyself be true, said Barry White. What do I mean by know your stage? Well, I'll tell you. How many people have thought to themselves, I'm doing these things my friends said and they're not really doing anything, but they said it would work. Or, I'm spending a lot of money trying this one thing that somebody said and unfortunately those Google ads are not doing anything. Or, I, I put the, ah, this, this is just, this is like continuous, I think, in all of our lives, just the internal, ah, just always. Uh, but I'm also trying things and not getting any results. This is a common thing that I hear, is I'm trying things and it's not working, it's actually detrimental. And I think this is because it's wrong the clock for whatever you're doing. Whatever you're trying to do, it's probably wrong the clock. I put the TM there because I've never heard of wrong the clock 
And now this is going to be on the internet, and I will be rich and famous for wrong o'clock. But what do I mean by wrong o'clock? <laughs> I can't even read it because it's so obvious that it makes me laugh. Different stages of development, and by development I mean your career, not like a touch project, but different stages of your career will have different productive activities. And then you might think to yourself, thanks, inspector. Wowzers, that's a real, a real nugget of information. But the problem is we never think about this. We, think of, we, we just think so, these crazy ideas, like the first time you got paid, you're like, oh, well, guess what? I'm gonna go spend all this money. Ah, that's insane. No, savings account, open the savings account. Or you get one more project than you feel comfortable doing alone, and you're like, oh my God, I have to hire somebody. Oh God, please don't hire people like early in your career. Please, take her easy, take her easy. So I broke this down into three stages of a career, and I, and I split it up into the solo practice and the company practice. And I'm gonna kind of blast through these as always because I want to get through this and have some time for questions. Stage one is what I call the portfolio and XP grind. This part sucks. There's no way to get around this. This is when you have nothing under your belt, your website's empty, you don't have cool projects, you often have to work for less money, you know, maybe you take a couple hundred bucks a day, 100 bucks a day, 150 bucks a day, whatever you can get to get some experience under your belt. You might have to sleep less, which I know is gonna sound crazy, because all my HQ beloveds out in the audience know I'm a big work-life balance believer. I'm always saying sleep eight hours a day. Anything less and you're limiting yourself. But during this stage, you might have to sleep a little bit less. You might have to do whatever you can to get a gig. And don't be picky. Freelance. Full time for six months, full time for three months, part time, you work two hours this week, you work six hours next week, you, oh, an internship that's like one day a week. You literally have to do whatever you can to get a portfolio together and to get experience and confidence in the field. Because this is the biggest thing I see now, is all these new users coming to Touch Designer, they feel confident in their studio to like work on cool stuff, they're making cool stuff, then they get a call and someone's like, well, we're gonna pay you and you have to sign this contract that says if you mess it up, like you're going to jail. And they're like, oh, well, I guess. Guess I'm never working again. Because you need confidence. And it's unfortunate that we work in high stress environments. It's unfortunate that clients are usually dicks. But you need confidence to go on those stages. So that's step one. Step one is for both companies and solo people, it's the grind. Grind it out. Now, stage two for the solo practitioner, I would say full time gig, dot, dot, dot. Maybe not ideal. And after you've got a little bit of experience under your belt, a little bit of confidence, a couple of cool names under your portfolio, I would say try and get a full-time gig anywhere where you think you can settle for a year or two, two years, three years. Somewhere where you would, you know, somewhere where you would want to leave an impact. Somewhere where you want to work with a team, get to know the people, not just some two or three month gig. Somewhere where you can sit down and let's set some roots. Because there's so many aspects of touch on your career that come from working with the same people over and over again, collaborating, you know, getting to know the hierarchies of the business world, how project management works, that you've never like had a project manager stand over your shoulder and say, hey, hey, you done yet? Because that's a thing you gotta deal with in the real world. But at this point, you do have experience and a portfolio. So look for decent pay, look for benefits. Don't get, don't get pushed around, don't be, you did your needy phase, the, you know, you did a year or two, three years of hunting for portfolios, getting a bunch of stuff under your belt. You're a confident person now. You should get paid, you should have benefits. You should ask for a relocation package if you need to have to move. And it might often mean you have to move somewhere where you don't want to live. You know, Kawhi Leonard came up to Toronto, he did a wonderful thing for us, but it was his full-time, maybe not ideal gig, and he's like, well, peace, I'm going to LA. Same thing, maybe you have to take a full-time gig somewhere, you don't, you know, maybe you're from New York and someone's like, hey, guess what, we got this gig in Cleveland, come live in Cleveland for a few years and like, hey, Cleveland. No, I, I like, I'm in Cleveland, I like Cleveland. We're on shade at Cleveland, but I'm saying, maybe it's not your ideal place. Life is long. A couple of years is not the worst thing ever. And then I'd recommend working on a bigger company if you're the kind of person who likes scope and limitations. Because if you work at a smaller company, you're gonna have to do everything under the sun, and some people like that, some people don't. So just be aware of where you're looking for a gig. If there's like four or five people at a company, get ready to be flexible. 
if you're going to a company with 100 plus employees, get ready to stay in your lane most of the time. And then stage two for businesses is client acquisition. Refine what you sell, become efficient at the thing you do, because that's how you make money. You know how you don't make money? Is doing a thing you have no idea how to do and it takes forever and you make a bunch of mistakes along the way. That's burning money. Making money is doing the thing you're really good at doing as fast as possible, as high quality as possible, repeatedly. And start to become a well-known name in your niche. Become a thought leader. Get perceived. Have your company be associated with the experts. You know, if that means you got to blog, or write, or talk to conferences, or share knowledge with the community, or take lots of meetings, do educational stuff, whatever that means for you specifically, maybe post on Instagram. This is where those kind of things come into handy. Post on Instagram in stage one. I guess, but good luck. Post on Instagram in stage two. Now we've got some marketing materials. And start charging more money, but also save. I should have just made a separate slide that says save a bunch of money. Because how many people in this room have had one year that's been the best year of their life and the next year that was immediately the worst year of your life? Back to back. And then, you know what, the funny thing is there's more hands for that that go up than the other thing that was like, how many people email clients and ask them about gigs? Which, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. So start a savings account, please. This is not the time where you, once you get paid, you don't want to go and start hiring and start buying all the best gear. Don't go out and buy 42080s and put them in a computer. You don't need that in the office. Even a 1080 is fine. I mean, my laptop at 970 is fine. And save three four, five months worth of expenses in a savings account. Because God knows you're gonna need them someday, and if you don't have them, that's when it's like, oh, well, I guess I gotta stop working on this, and I gotta go work part-time on my other gig, and then guess what business suffers? All of your main business, and then all of a sudden you're out of business and you're full-time doing the other thing that you don't want to do. Stage two is also important because you want to become picky about who you're working with. You know, maybe in stage one you're working with anyone out of the sun, and stage two, you're thinking to yourself, well, you know what I would like? Working in architecture, working with architects on technology. Now you start refining, you know, instead of every single person in 100 kilometers, you're saying every single architect in 100 kilometers. Start becoming picky about where you want to take your work. And focus on activities that promote healthy cash flow. Money coming in and out of your company regularly is a good thing. If I had the option between getting paid $10,000 every month or $120,000 in January, I'd probably take $10,000 every month. And I know the time value of money, like I don't know and all that stuff. But it's for business, it's easier to run a business when there's consistently money coming and going and you know everything's trackable and a little bit more regular. So start to build that idea of I want to do gigs, I want to do gigs regularly, maybe not immediately jumping into mega projects, you know, doing a lot of small projects over the course of the years. It's a healthy way to operate a company. And then stage three for the solo, solo folks, is the full-time gig, dot, 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 long-term career path and rewards. This is where, you know, you start to think, okay, well, what's the company I want to settle down for five years and move up that ladder? Where do I want to start as maybe an intermediate senior developer, wherever you feel yourself are, and start to work up to maybe being the director of, of interactive at that company, or being a team lead, or, or being able to propose your own pitches for these, you know, companies and get clients. This is the stage three, and I won't read all of these because keep getting through slides, but this is where now after a few years of experience working at a company, you got a nice resume, you got a nice portfolio, now you can start going up to companies and saying, hey, I really like the work you're doing, maybe you are or are not hiring, but I'm looking, and I got, I'm an asset. You guys want some of this? And then stage three for business. This is when you can start talking about hiring after you've had your grind, you did the grind, you got experience, you got portfolio, you did stage two, you started making healthy cash flow, regular income and money, regular outgoing money, and then you can start hiring. And then don't just hire a developer. Usually the developer, if you're a developer and you hire another developer, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Usually the most useful person you can hire will be maybe a marketing person that's gonna start helping you get bigger and better gigs. Maybe it's an administrative assistant that can just deal with emails, manage your clients, sign paperwork, so that you can do the work that you love. Maybe the most valuable person you can hire is 
graphic designer that just does mock-ups, or a motionographer who does all the C4D renders for the client. Maybe these are, the, don't always default to thinking, well, I do touch design projects, and the next person I hire is like another touch design developer. Think about your company, think about your specific needs and what the highest value person you can bring onto your team is. And then figure out the break points. Figure out how many projects do I need to be doing before I need another developer? How many clients do I have before I think to myself, hey, you know it'd be good, somebody to kind of just like deal with them so I don't have to deal with them. Make little break points for yourself, real numbers. And start creating long-term partners and even start to set up you know, the, the hilarious satellite offices. I have satellite offices all over the world. I just get an Airbnb and I show up and that's my satellite office. You know, start taking business trips. If you're in New York, maybe you start traveling to LA every couple of months just to say hi to everybody. See who's out there, see what they're doing. Start making these relationships. And please don't do things at wrong o'clock. Don't start your company and spend all your money. Don't start your company and get two gigs and be like, well, I guess I'm hiring. But to people, this is a terrible thing to do. Build your algorithm. I'm getting close on time, so I'm gonna go a little bit on this one. People think that picking who you're gonna hire is like the easiest thing. This is like, people stress so hard about who they're gonna hire and bring onto a project, and most of the time we don't even realize it. It is one of the most, one of the most complicated and stressful things is who are we gonna like, which, are we gonna go with these person to buy the TV? Are they gonna buy the TV? Are they gonna buy the TV? Are they gonna, but they can also do this, and they can also do this. And we often simplify it to this. So we often think this is what's going on. This is our client, and you know, for the first time they're spreading their wings on the bike, and then you have like, you know, a famous person here popping wheelies, and you think that's it, the game is over. I can't pop a wheelie like this. I'm not getting out of here. In reality, every single person on the client team is stressing and calculating and rethinking and examining, and they have no idea what the right answer is but they have decisions to make. And if you want to quantify that a little bit more, you know, in reality and less gifts, we often summarize the whole process of getting hired down to these two points. Am I famous? No. If you're just starting out with a little, would you call it a smiley face if it's not smiling? Or just some emoji? Then you have the famous company, hell yes, they're famous. And then you think, well, if I'm a no on the famous scale, then I have to become a capitalized yes on the are they cheap scale. Because we know the famous people aren't cheap. And you're like, okay, well, that's all I've got to do, and that's why everyone ends up working for free. And if you work for free, you don't get cash flow. Without cash flow, you work for free forever. It's a vicious cycle. But actually what happens, and like I said with those math equations, this isn't even all of, this is just like the first things that came off the top of my head. This is the actual equation going on. There's you and how much, I mean the famous company is going to be expensive. You don't have to be working for free, but you can be affordable. Okay, okay. affordable. How fast can you do it? Can you do it faster than the famous people? Will you work longer hours? Are you famous? Not yet. That's okay. Don't worry. We've got other statistics. You know, what do my colleagues think of them? Are they nice? Are they perceived experts, what we say? How many times are they going to give us revisions? You know, some people only give one or two revisions. Maybe you up your revision count. Make, make your formula look real nice. You know, we're talking about number of assigned staff. Some companies don't like it when there's 20 people working on the project. It doesn't feel personalized. Sometimes people just want one, two people to be dedicated. These are our people working on the project. We can communicate them. We can check in with them every day. We can talk about all the aspects of one or two people and not have to worry about, oh, well, we're talking to a project manager today and they won't let us talk to the developers. Why don't they let us talk to the developers? Well, because there's too many of them. You know, dedicated account managers. Number of site visits. Are they easy to work with? Will they white label? All of these things play into the equation of getting hired for a project. And, if we turn this into a hilarious algorithm, often what happens is you have you at the top here, and you have you know your famous level, your cost, number of site visits, your revisions, your blog posts. You know, are you going to white label? And then the question mark is, how does this compare to the offering of the famous company? Well, yeah, they're famous, but they're double the cost, and they're going to give us only one site visit and only one revision. Like, what if we want to iterate? Those those guys maybe they have less experience, but they're going to iterate for us. Like, 
And, and the famous guys want white label, they want us to stamp their name everywhere, like, that's not good for us. And then what happens is, if you make a nice equation, you can start beating out the famous people. You can say, my value that I'm bringing across all these vectors is actually greater than the value of this famous, the famous name, it's worth something. But is it worth double the cost? One less site visit? Only one revision? One revi Do you know how stressful one revision? One revision? When I got that logo made, I had more than one revision. Like, and we're talking about experiences that cost lots of money with lots of equipment. People like revisions. If you can start offering these other levels of your algorithm, you'll make a case for yourself. And the crazy part is we dictate our algorithm. They're not telling us, well, maybe they're at, well, sometimes they'll tell you, well, you, we need four revisions, or, 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 or. but actually we dictate these algorithms. When we come to the table and we're talking to clients and we're telling people our story, we can tell them, hey, we're a flexible company. We know Agile. We know you guys want to do revisions. We offer lots of revisions. We also know how important this relationship is. We're willing to do many site visits. You know, don't worry about it, we'll cover it. Et cetera, et cetera. You build this story about your algorithm. Don't default to just the two point, the two point system of cheap and fame. So to recap, step one, focus on your narrative. If I ask you what you do when you read text specs, you're saying, I don't know, I do a lot of stuff, I will literally never hire you for work. Step two, be hungry AF. And not just artistically hungry, but like hungry to live. Hungry enough that you will email people you've never met. Hungry enough that you will bother the people you know so that you can start getting work. Step three, know your stage, know where you are. Don't operate at wrong o'clock, please. Have a savings account, for God's sakes, just have a savings account. Have a savings account, every time you get paid, put 50% of it in the savings account, and don't buy computers with it. Step four, build that algorithm. Start to dictate your value points, because that's how you're gonna get gigs over other competitors. So that finally, step five, Scrooge Mc, you can Scrooge McDuck it up, and have a nice career, long career, get eight hours of sleep a night, work on cool stuff, and all the things we all dream about doing. So with that said, thank you. I'm Elbers. Thanks very much, Elbers. Um, are there any questions for Elbers? Hardest question to Yeah, so uh, obviously there's a lot of uh, business development uh, strategies in your talk, but how would you go, uh, let's say, the, the more uh, you keep uh, emailing clients and stuff like that, the less you uh, work in touch designer, and when some gigs start uh, get, getting accumulated, you will do less business development, so is there a way to balance it out together? What's your insight on that? So two things. One, this is exactly why I said hiring a touch design developer is usually not the best first hire for people, because you find that you're doing touch stuff, you're doing marketing development, then all of a sudden you have a project like, oh God, I can't do my marketing, and I can't do my emails, and I can't manage my clients, so who do I need help from? Somebody to do that. So that's usually like one of the steps, because even if you get like a freelancer, you don't have to bring somebody on full time, you bring somebody on part time, once a week they're kind of doing this business development. And the other thing is just be efficient. So many people waste half of their day, Slack is a disease, having your email open is an ailment, Con notifications on the phone are the worst thing that's ever happened to humanity. Turn all of it off. If you literally have only touched on or open on your computer and your phone is off, you will blast through projects at a rate you've never experienced. It'll be like that movie with uh, Bradley Cooper when he takes the, the, and then like the time and space flies around him. That's what your life is gonna be like in touch -down. So that's the two things I would say. One is to just become more efficient. We have too many hours in a day. And then the second would be to, uh, Think about those things when you're thinking, okay, well now I'm starting to get some projects. I have a little bit of money. Who can I bring on maybe even part-time to help with those kind of things? There's a second question back here. Hi. Um, do you have any <laughs> do you have any um, advice for someone who wants to transition careers and has a full-time paying good salary job and um, maybe 
wants to uh, change careers just because it's more their passion. Yeah, so there's a lot of ways you can approach this, and it really depends on the kind of person you are. Some people do the first method, which is bank as much money as possible at your job, get six months to a year's worth of expenses ready, and then quit and get real hungry real fast. That's like one way. The other way is what a lot of side startup business people do is you've got your full-time job, you're strict about allocating hours every day after work to work on this side project, and you start to build up some of the base materials that you need, you know, your bio, your website, your portfolio, maybe you're just doing little gigs here and there, maybe you're posting on Instagram, doing blog stuff. You're kind of building this project on the side until there's a point where you think, you know what? I have enough stuff ready that if I made the jump now, I could start taking gigs, I could start emailing people, could start getting gigs. I think that's probably a healthy way to approach it. Um, and then the other thing that I would always add is whatever field you're coming from, do not abandon your skill set. This is like the, the disease we all have is we hate what we're doing so much and then we come to touch design here and then we're like, you know what, I never want to do that again. Even though that's probably a very valuable skill that combined with touch designer would make you a lot of money. So those are the kind of ways I would approach it. I think saving, having a good runway in the bank is good and then on the other hand, working around the side, build stuff out and then when you feel ready to kind of make the jump, cut the ties and, and get hungry. We have time for one more question, if anybody... Hi, so I have a question, oh, I've got a comment. Yes, um, please. You're my as, as someone who does the hiring for freelances, yeah. and I just, for anyone here who's scared about doing cold calling and uh, emails out to people, it feels scary, right? I can't network, it's... But on the other side, you've got a stressed out manager who's got too much work on their plate who's looking, how do I build up my, my team? So the people I hire are the people who reach out to me. And it's the ones who tell me why they found my company, um, what they're passionate about, and I will call them back. It's amazing, right? Yeah, they help us find you and let's work together. So if anybody wants somebody to email, <laughs> come by and see me. Valerie is great, NGX is great. I I'll give you my email. <laughs> and, and that goes on a bigger point, which I mentioned briefly, but gigs exist before they're advertised. If you're out there looking for gigs and telling everybody, you know what you just saved the hiring person on that team? Posting the job, following up with interview, blah, blah. You save that person so much time. If you went straight, you're Neo going to the source, and you're like, I need, I'm looking for work. And they're like, oh, great, well, we've got a bunch of things. I don't even have to do all this hiring nonsense. We'll take it. That is all. Thanks very much, Elvis. No problem. Thank you.